Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. I have in the studio with me probably the smartest person I've had on this show. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, I'd like to welcome Professor Ian White. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. It's a it's a busy time of year for us. Uh, I bet it all is. All the new students are back. Yep. They're born in 2001. Yep. Or around that time, which makes you, you know, I've got clothes older than a lot of them. But um, it's great to see them. And they bring a lot of energy around the campus. And it reminds me why you do what you do. Yes. And, um, yes. So, yeah, first teaching Monday morning. So after this, I'll just finish my lectures. and uh, That's good. Yeah. It's a busy time, but yep. it's good to be busy. But it's good to be busy. You don't want to yeah. be bored, do you? Well, no, I can't remember. <laughs> so I was bored at work. <laughs> Certainly not bored in semester time. Yes, that's for certain. I bet. So obviously, um, the first thing I want to ask is, what is environmental planning? Because I'm sure a lot of people don't know exactly what this is. It, it's a good place to start because a lot of people don't know. And um, even a lot of people who think they do probably don't because it, it differs quite a lot. Yeah. So basically, the broad idea is that we've got a lot of land, we've got a lot of resources, we've got mm -hmm. minerals, we've got a lot of things we like in society, water, or things we value. Someone's going to make decisions over how we, prote how we protect them, um, how we use it sustainably. And, and so there's a bit of a land allocation, resource allocation aspect, but, and that's at its most basic, but it's much more than that. So you've also got things around, um, I mean, a good way to think about it is what would happen if we didn't have environmental planning. And it was just a free-for-all and you could build where you want, you could do what you want and what would the world look like? You know, imagine it would be pretty. Yeah. Is there any countries where that's the no. case? Okay. No. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it shows that we need rules yes. and we need regulations, but it's beyond that in order to actually work out things around fairness and yep. justice. So um, if there's anything that, I mean, let, let's, do a little exercise. What's your favorite bit of Hamilton? What's the, what's the place you like the most? Probably the Hamilton Gardens, really. Well, that was a planning decision quite a while ago to turn it from a refuse dump into a gardens. Yeah. They fought over that. So yeah. someone fought, who you don't know, yep. have had no engagement with, for future generations to enjoy something, and they would never... You know, they would never have a voice otherwise. So a lot of what planning does is protect what's of value as well and to give the things that make a city a place to live. So there's a big debate in Hamilton all the time, and less so now actually, but it has been over the last, sort of before the last election, about what is the purpose of the city? What should we provide? Is it bins and pipes and, and, and that kind of infrastructure thing? Or should we be doing a little bit more? So you've had... Various people on the show mm -hmm. um, who are interested in the city and um, its economic development, its tourism, putting shows on. Yep. Should we get involved in that? And so there's the reach of planning differs in different places as well. So making a place a good place to live is part of it unofficial about what makes a good planner rather than someone just allocates land. So... Um, it's partly around fairness of resources and protection, but there's also um, an element where someone's got to make the decisions around connectivity. So the reasons we don't have a train is because of planning decisions other people have made. There's yep. not enough people living in the right place who work in those areas. So it's a bit of what they call um, sort of regional economic geography. Um, and so what planning can do is also influence where people live over 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years right. in order to make stuff like that viable and connect regions and global triangles and also oh, the, the golden triangle. Yes. So there's a whole lot of things it could do, but the government has got to allow it to do it. And in New Zealand, we have a particularly poor planning system. And I know. <laughs> well, it's a bold yeah, that, statement. That, that, but, well, well uh, it's, it's pretty obvious. I mean, if you go over to overseas to any city you can see that we're a bit backwards here yeah i think part of it is i mean say all the stuff that we have in new zealand you look at um say you had a line manager who was in charge of new zealand not just in there just someone in, in in charge and say okay look we've got terrible water quality we've got a housing crisis we've got no train lines anywhere yeah we've got third most obese uh, country in the world. We've got, I think, the top five car ownership rates in the world. Um, what have you been doing? <laughs> and, and so there's the indicators of our current environment are a, you know, a bit of an indictment over what we saw planning in the past, but that is changing. And mm. I'm really hopeful with some of the changes that have been made uh, and are being made over the, the next last few years and these few years that we're going to get actually some really good 
what I call spatial planning rather than sort of development control of you know thinking about buildings and so on so when you say spatial planning what do you mean exactly uh well that, that's just probably another good question about what is planning so um when we get to i mean a lot of what planning is people think it's about you know, building height or design or you know the kind of stuff you see going up around your neighborhood mm. but it's and that's just a building and that's building regulations and that's maybe to stop it falling down or earthquake strengthening or to make sure you don't annoy your neighbors but that's only a very very sort of small part of it what i'm really interested in is around a 20 30 40 50 year vision of a region so i think new zealand is unbalanced i think there's too much economic concentration in auckland and that, and I now agree. and now you're starting to get some real disadvantages of living there. You've got major congestion. You've got really poor air quality. You know, it's, it's one of the most, look to camera, <laughs> livable cities in the world, but it's not, you know? And yeah, yeah. It's only because we collect the data in certain ways that that could ever happen. So, so this, how, how do they collect the data in terms of that? Because I'm from Auckland, I moved down here, and I definitely don't rate it as, what, what is it, number 10 or something under yeah, most livable it, cities or something like that? Basically, You've got to you've got to give the the data to those people who collect you know who do that kind of auditing basically it's city auditing so you give them data on certain things, but there's certain things they don't collect and it's because it would disadvantage these large global cities. Right. So um, there's a lot of things about sort of governance and general things around safety and investment. Um, so basically, if any city in New Zealand. And so they will probably be top 20 in the world just because of the nature of the New Zealand political environment, which scores highly on all these indicators. Right. So um, if Hamilton, I was going to do an exercise one time where I wondered if I could get Hamilton to number one livable city in the world just by completely manipulating the data, <laughs> the data <laughs> in a really unrigorous manner. Um, but just as a bit of a thought exercise, and you probably could, I think, and in the way that if you had congestion and there was a new indicator, we would outscore um, both Wellington and Auckland straight away. Mm. And, and then you start to... So part of the critique of all these kind of things, it's almost like a global tourism for economic investment managers so uh, or global talent. So it's for your big KPMGs and, and your big uh, have corporate offices in each one who are competing. So these cities are competing for this what we call mobile capital. So they invest here. Why should we invest in Auckland other than Singapore? And so you're, you're, you know, it's a bit PR-ish, it's a bit corporate branding, a bit city branding, in, in order to create this idea of a livable place to attract mobile investment and mobile talent. So mm. that's one of its purposes. So, but you've got to play the game. You've got to collect the data and you've got to invest in it in order to enter. And then you know, there's nothing to stop Hamilton doing that. I mean, it could do. It would be a really interesting exercise if we collected the data and said, we're going to go in for it this year. Well, why don't you could be the one to... Yeah. Start that off. Kick it off. I'll just squeeze it in with all the other <laughs> stuff I'm doing. But um, this is, I mean, it's a really good example of going back to what is livable and, and what is we, how we allocate value to things we value. Because a lot of things that we value don't get captured in those exercises. Yeah. So have you spoken to local and central government about this? Uh, no, I don't know whether about this particular topic. Um, but they've never I come speak, to I speak to them a lot. On, oh, you do? So things. do they come to you and be like, hey, we want your thoughts on this? Or do you go to them and give Is them it... no choice? <laughs> <laughs> that, no, they've, they've, uh, I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the things about being an academic is that you're, you're ignored for 95% of the time by, oh. by central and local government. Um, That's not good. Yeah, well, but they've got a lot of people who are having the time and... and I think basically the key is collecting evidence. Evidence is really important. And, and that's one of the things that I do most of my time is do research. So, on... how, so how do you collect evidence? What's your method of, of, of getting it? Well, it depends on the topic. Uh, this is actually what I'm teaching on Monday morning okay. is research methods and, and how, to, how to conduct research. But what I generally do is the way it works as an academic is, is that you bid for pots of money from government to right. do things. So the government would have these pots and they would say we invite bids on this so yep. they're making assumptions over what they value okay and what they need evidence on and also assumptions about what they don't and so there um you see these and then you might bid and put a case together about why they should give it to you mm. and that's what i spend a lot of my time actually doing so this is what you know probably the, the hidden stuff of academia a lot of people wouldn't know is that, yeah so I I, I, i've just been working with um, niwa who are the oh yes um 
basically the weather, climate, environment people um, to put together a bid. I think it's fifteen and a half million dollars for a a national map of uh, flooding across New Zealand. We don't have one. It's all done in different ways by every local local authority. It does it in different ways, and they spend their own money on it. So basically, this bid is to do one national map to um, do it in a consistent way, do it in the same quality everywhere in order so we know that decisions are, are made on the same quality nationwide. So okay. that probably took months to put that bid together. There's probably over 50 people involved. Um, wow. I'm leading uh, the bit which is about making it work. Yeah. So there's a load of technical people who are doing the modeling and, and looking at best practice from particularly in Europe and the UK, about how they've, because they've had more problems in flooding than us. So they've had more um, investment in supercomputers to manage and monitor rainfall and how it hits the urban environment, how it changes. And so they've got, we've got a load of people who are putting together this new Wizbang computer, which I don't understand an awful lot about. Um, but this is why we work in teams. And yeah, then, yeah. Um, my job is to make it relevant to the people who make decisions and right. to make it useful. So that's... N, or um, L is actually being submitted early next week, but it's done. So if that happens, that will be five years, five years of my life uh, wow. leading part of this research team, and um, that's going to make this happen. And that probably accounts for about I don't know, between twenty and thirty percent of my job. Yeah, if it comes off, and if it doesn't, I've got. There's, I mean, that's only one of my research beds. So I've got, I've got, and another one which was just actually. With scientific, this is actually a fascinating topic yeah. because this is what I get really excited about, as well as teaching. I love teaching, but so I've just got given some money from the government, and it, it's quite a, a big part of money to research. Basically, the pitch is we know an awful lot of science about things that are happening in the world and phenomena and climate change and housing crisis, and we know it really. But we don't do anything about it. No, we don't. And so it's not a science problem, really. It's not well. It's not what we call a deficit problem. It's not if you find a bit more about something, you know, you get one new ice core, and everyone goes, you know what, you were right about that climate change mm. thing. It, it it's not an information deficit. So we don't necessarily need to have more science on on some of these. That's not where the problem lies. The problem is is that the science isn't influencing what we do. And, and that means there's something quite interesting going on between science and politics. And, and the way that this form of knowledge is sort of butting up against other forms of knowledge or other forms of decisions. So, so I've got um, four years worth of grant money. This is a big grant to look at what we're calling difficult decisions. So basically, we're going to find the hardest decisions. So. <laughs> and we're going to try and work out why we're not using the science to influence. I'll give you a couple of examples. Okay. So one case study we, we're, we're toying with is uh, what happens if Taranaki erupts? Um, I was just talking about this literally, I think, a month ago because I went to the Festival of Lights. And I was wondering that because I heard that it was supposed to explode within the next 50 years. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. You're probably not too far off, actually. I mean, it's... It's difficult working out what's due to explode just because of the, the the data we have. It's really difficult to work out in the time series or not assign probabilities to future events. It's just mm. in, in natural hazards. It's one of the predicting the future is actually very difficult. Um, but you can you can make assumptions about when things are more likely or less likely. But Taranaki is coming up to be. You know, it's like a, we're waiting for a bus, you know. It, might, yeah, it yeah. might come soon, it might come far away, but you're looking at the geology and it'll happen at some point. In the same way that we know that New Zealand's earthquake prone and oh, of course. Wellington, Wellington exactly. it, yeah, is yeah. probably, sometime this century, you would imagine it would get a significant shake. It's had, it's had a number of the last few years. Do you think it was a very stupid idea to build a city there? They didn't know. I mean, I mean, to be fair, they, <laughs> they didn't know. Yeah, yes, that's uh, true. They didn't have the data we we have now. I mean, if you're forming a country now, you might make different decisions. But I mean, it, it's also it's not just it's there, but it's the concentration of our government, our decision making yeah, prowess, the way that we allocate resources and budgets. So there's probably a good example for devolution in the fact that to move some of our essential services and infrastructure away from areas at high risk. So I'm. I know Hamilton is one of the lowest risk places in the country. Yeah, that's why Andrew King, when he was mayor, he wanted the capital to move here. But I don't know how. 
It doesn't necessarily... Logistically possible, that is. I don't think you're ever going to move the capital to it, yeah. but you can move parts of the government machinery out of uh, uh, these central locations, which is what they do in a lot of countries anyway for good yeah. planning. So they do it, for, they've done it in parts of the UK, for example, <clears throat> because they realized that power was too much concentrated in London. The wealth was concentrated too much in London and it was driving house prices because too many people wanted to live in one place. So they devolved arms of governments to the regions mm. where house prices are lower. You can actually give people a better quality of life by, you know, if you move government departments to Hamilton, for example, you'd both stimulate the Hamilton economy. They could probably get a bigger house and, and if they wanted to move. And, and, so, and it would rebalance the economy away from sort of these hot centers. It's such a weird economy in New Zealand. So you've got yeah. you've got Auckland, which is basically a third of the country, but it's more than that from economic terms. And it's like it's unusual internationally. So Dublin's probably the closest equivalent of, of you got a country like Ireland with Dublin, where there's a big concentration of wealth. Similar population too. Yeah, and a lot of that wealth and, and the, the actual the, the economy's got a similar um sort of profile. But a lot of that wealth in in Ireland was in housing and they had they had a big housing crash. Mm. And you're looking at what, where our wealth is in New Zealand and you know, how we generate an additional capital. And part of it is in housing as an asset, mm. as an investment. And that makes it vulnerable to global changes. So we've got the coronavirus going on now. Yeah. Already affecting stock markets. Um, our capital is going to go away from stocks towards safer havens. Our pro is property a safe haven? What happens if the property market goes down? Then it's going to flee elsewhere. And so there's all these long-term issues around economic restructuring, which we should be thinking about in New Zealand, but we don't. Um, or we don't enough. I think we're starting to a little bit now, but anyway. Yeah, so uh, so I've got this project called Difficult Decisions. Going back okay. to what we're <laughs> far away from <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's all right, that's all right. Um, which is, so the Taranaki is due to happen in broad terms yeah. at some point. We've actually got good data, very recent data, last year or two, about flow paths and what might happen and those kind of things. I'm not sure it's in the public domain yet, but one of the things we're interested in is that that should be. You know, we've, science has found out something. That's the purpose of science, is to find these things out. Then it should go into the political realm and the politicians can basically decide what to do with it and so on. But it's it's not. So we're taking this as one of the difficult decisions and thinking, well, if we've got this data, how how do we just interact with it? I mean, it's so big. Do we have to move people away? How certain are we? How fast might this happen? Um, do we compensate people? Do we leave things as it is? I mean, this is there's no one right answer, but we're not even having the discussion. So we're going to be working with people at risk and with communities at risk to just start to introduce this information and start to think about what should we do with it because there's no one answer yeah well i think i saw uh if mount taranaki explodes like a, a little diagram of what the red zones will be and i i think i saw that new plymouth actually wasn't in the red zone but all the little towns but i don't know how accurate that this is i don't even know what's real and what's fake these days yeah well <laughs> it, it's it's real but um that data is probably quite, you know, it, it's quite old. Well, it's any of these, any any risk maps are based on a series of assumptions about um, the the size of the event and and what it lands on and um, a whole lot of things. And you can't maybe make them out when you just see it as a you know an image. So there's a lot of stuff behind that that we that scientists need to be able to look at the caveats and unpack it. So. If you look at any flood risk maps, it changes every time you do it. Mm. And it'll be the same with the, uh, same with the earthquake maps. It'll yeah. be the same with also because we get more data. So this is a bit of a movable feast. And it's a good way to think about it. It's, this is what we know now. Yeah. But it ain't facts. It's, you know, it, it's just what we, our best guess at the moment. And how do we respond to making decisions when things are so uncertain? But we still should act. So if Taranaki exploded, for example, or erupted, um, do you think it would just be the Taranaki region that would be affected or no? I don't know. Well, that, I mean, it's actually a really good question because this is one of the things that we research also about what is what is at risk and what is an impact and, and what is so this really fascinating new topic that's come in the last few, about five years or so, called cascading impacts where 
So you'd have your direct impacts, you know, the people who the, the, who might be affected directly by the flows. Um, we can mitigate some of that by good warning systems. We should probably get a sense of when things are getting closer um, and evacuation zones and all these. So you can mitigate some of the, the, the direct impacts on people. Then you're going to lose properties. Same with the bushfires in Australia. It's exactly mm. the same kind of thing. Then you'll lose, uh, you know, the properties and then the insurers will generally pick that up. So they wear the cost for some of that. Um, and it's EQC in New Zealand. And then beyond that, you've got, it, it gets quite complicated and also actually pretty interesting because you've got things which are much softer, like loss of business confidence. So if you're, if you've got, I talk about mobile capital, if you've got money to invest, you might be a little bit less likely to invest there uh, because of perceptions of risk. And you saw that in Christchurch. Yes. Um, and so you've also got things around, but what else, what parts of the economy in New Zealand relies on that part of the world, the Taranaki local economy? And so there'll be all these connections which are really difficult to unpick until you experience them about supply chains, business confidence, which will have a knock-on effect on the New Zealand economy. One of the interesting things about the, the Christchurch earthquake was it actually it kept parts of New Zealand out of the global financial crisis because of the, the construction boom required so much investment that it just it, it provided this internal flow of money when the external flow of money was being cut off in the global financial crisis. So the negative kind of became a positive in that sense, I suppose. Well, yeah, well it solved swings and roundabouts with capital because it's still struggling in parts of it 10 years later. So... Um, this I'm making the point that this is much more complex yeah, and complicated yeah. and trying to work out impacts and benefits and risks and who wears it and so on. So I mean that's one of the one of the areas. The other one which I've been fascinated about since I moved to New Zealand was the the Haraki Plains. I mean oh, yes. they're, they're so low. I mean they are and so the sea level rise roughly has gone up. Um I I think over over the I think it's I don't remember off the top of my head how many centimeters in the last century in the in, in the last century, but that is accelerating or in recent times has gone faster. We're not quite sure why, because it's still I don't know, we, we're not quite sure how the ice sheets in Antarctica are, are reacting to change. Antarctica was was it the Arctic was twenty degrees. Yeah, I read that just the other day. That is just that's insane. We talk about models and predictions. That would not be in any model of anywhere, anywhere in the world because you'd just think it would be such an outlier. That, that wouldn't happen. And yet yeah. it happened. So scientists are struggling to incorporate these in the data. So we don't quite know how sea level is going to rise, but uh, we know, we, we've we measured it because we've got, we've got figures from the main ports in New Zealand for you know, a century and a half. We know it's gone up. And those are firm figures. We don't know how fast it's going to carry on coming up, but we can make some pretty good assumptions now. On top of that, Haraki Plain's going down. So it's, um, and in parts of it, going down actually way faster than sea levels rising because of groundwater extraction um, is actually compacting the ground and there's less water. And it's just, you know, it's just, you see it in drought in your garden, you know, things sort of go down. Mm -hmm. So you've got this really weird, um, well, unlucky concurrence of things where you've got a seed going up and the ground going down. So 2100, what's that going to look like? How much money should New Zealand invest in protecting that and keeping it as it is? It's quite a low value land in some of it. It would actually, it might cost more to protect it than just to buy it, you know, and, and to, that, so there might be other options available for parts of that which are particularly vulnerable. Or we could just maybe leave it to nature and then that's not fair on the people who live there because you might start to see their sort of their main asset, which is their farm or their house, start to become flooded more frequently and they can't sell it. Or maybe we can do something much more interesting around the idea of creating sort of new wetlands which can sort of ad adapt and, and take on some of this water and protect people and just manage land use over a few decades in this long-term way of small steps away from danger. Or we can just keep continuing to build in levees and hope one day they won't fail. But Would you advise that more people move inland? I, well, 
I've read that insurance companies might stop covering people who are, have houses on the coast. Yeah, that that they're, they're already doing that already. Yeah, you know, and and there's there's insurance and there's you know insurance or practically so in parts of the world you might have insurance, but you might have a a major excess of twenty thousand pounds or something. Yeah, is that really what insurance is all about? You know, it's not protecting you. So insurance is basically risk transfer. I give you money, and you take the risk. Yeah, and that's the deal. But. It only works as long as it's a good deal for both sides. So basically, insurance is gambling, you know, and <laughs> yes. and the most simple ways they're gambling that they're not going to get major events in any year, um, and that uh, you know what well, they actually, and at, at natural hazards and and risks are one of my research shows. So it's actually quite an interesting topic, insurance, because they can they can at, in any one year twelve month period they can just say no, I'm not doing this next year. And it puts them in a really strong position with regard to these long-term changes. More banks, 25 years maybe because of the mortgage holder. People might be living in these places all their lives. So a lot of the, the risk is worn by the people who live there rather than insurer. Because they just they just want – risk is good. With no risk, they have no business. You know? and, and so what they want to do is price that risk. And that's what climate change makes it difficult is they don't quite know what figure they should attach with these days. And so – more data helps them make a more informed decision about what that value should be. They charge that, you transfer the risk, and then we do it again every year. But it's a business model that is quite, you know, it's quite risky for the homeowners because the insurers can walk away. And, yeah. and, and, and they will, because if it doesn't work out for them. So if I, I remember speaking to a global insurer when I worked in the UK who wouldn't insure parts of New Zealand. In fact, it wouldn't insure New Zealand at all. At all. It was too risky. Basically, you think about from their point of view, we're a country which is one of the most risk-prone or hazard-prone countries in the entire world. Anything you can think of, we've got it. Tsunamis, earthquakes, exploding mountains, oh, yeah. whatever, whatever you think of, it's here. And a lot of them are big. And if it happens, they're out of business. Yeah. If they're exposed. So that this is why we have EQC because it's 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 like a quasi state thing. So the state wears it because the private companies can't. So you know, earthquake cover isn't a commercial viability in New Zealand really because if it happens, you haven't got enough money. Yeah, everyone's out of business. Sorry. So this is why we have the state operate as an insurer. In, in this area. And they've done the same with flooding in the UK now because the, the private sector decided that it's happening too frequently and, it's, and the business model doesn't really work for us anymore. So if you think about what, what I actually quite like is house, you know, and from a risk perspective is uh, things around burglary or house fires. And they're, they're predictable. They're, they pepper pot amongst a population. You can sort of get an idea with postcodes and you can risk and it's the same every you know, it's quite predictable. A bushfire, you know, you, you, you're a little bit more gambling there in that how big is it going to be? How fast is it going to go? How is it going to spread? And so you're making more of a risk judgment. And so these are the big global risks that are affecting. You know, so if, if New Zealand is such a risk-prone country, then yeah. how come you opted to move here from the UK? <laughs> well, there's... Um, there's a lot of nice things too, uh, <laughs> and there, there's I, I, I um, oh, that's were a great you, call it a life. Yeah. Were you aware of all this stuff before yeah, you came? Yeah, okay, yeah, right. yeah. so um, and I, I think the thing about New Zealand is that it, it's also, I mean, this is one of the weird juxtapositions. It's one of the riskiest places away from natural hazards, but it's also one of the safest from a lot of the you know the political governance aspects. You know, you're not going to get. No natural predators. Yeah, yeah, you don't. And and so there's there's you know you've got rights, you've got access to legal support. There's there's a whole lot of things which make it safer for people as well. Okay. And it's also part of. I mean, you know, when when Trump got elected and Brexit, and there was quite a there's a, a little bit of a, a trend internationally around. Um, you know, you, you see the doomsday preppers and and the people who oh. are buying the bunkers, and it's New Zealand is seen as a safe place. For when, you know, I always use the phrase when the zombies attack. You know, yeah, yeah. It, it is kind of because we've got everything. We also have everything we need to be self-sufficient. We've got we've got the fish, we've got the the, the, the plants, 
We've got all the natural resources we need. And actually, it's remote from a lot of the other places. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, it is a risky from a natural hazard perspective, but so is a lot of lovely places to live, you know? Mm. So is all of the West Coast of the US, San Francisco, Vancouver, very nice. All these areas. So there's risk everywhere. There's risk crossing the road. I mean, if you were worried about risk, you know, you wouldn't drive a car. And you know, uh, no. this is this is the kind of the perception of a future risk, and which can seem big when your day to day risk when you're used to it just doesn't. And and how do we make decisions on that is you know one of the things that I research. So perception of risk versus its actual statistic kind of thing where we can make more informed decisions around what we know and what we don't know. Yeah, in regards to Auckland, yeah, because Auckland is similar, I suppose to London in terms of you've got a vast amount of the population situated in one yeah. one area. But I find the difference with London is it has a good public transport system, whereas Auckland does not, right? So if you, if you don't live in London, you can still commute from outside the city into the city for work, where you can't really do that with Auckland. Well, you can, but you'll be <laughs> spending a lot of time. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that's something that really needs to... That would help with, I suppose, helping people move out of the city in terms of... I think you're already seeing it and in the fact that we've got... Have you heard of the halo effect, which is yes. a, 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 where, where basically anywhere within a certain radius of Auckland is picking up a lot of economic growth and population growth yeah. through... No, through no real policies of our own, we haven't. Uh, this is unearned wealth. It's a little bit like a, a minor lottery win. You know, we, we, we're we're getting this really great influx of people who, um, you know, generally in the twenties and thirties um, in Hamilton, they're the people who have young families looking to. They've they've maybe worked in Auckland a bit. They've decided that they can't afford to buy. They want to set up a family. They want to buy a house. They look for jobs. You know, there's some jobs where you get a massive Auckland benefit, you know, some of the creative industries or, or you know, media or elsewhere. But if you're mm. working for the government, you know, there's there's very similar pay scales around the place. So you can actually, you know, do do things. Um, so if I moved to Auckland and got a job at Auckland University, my quality of life would go down, even if I got paid more, you know. And, and, and Would you get paid more, though? Do yeah. You- is that how it works? Like, yeah. it, it, okay, so you would get paid more if you were working at like the University of Auckland. Yeah, but yeah. I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily want to work at the University of Auckland because of the wider things that we're looking at, which is, it works if you've got enough money to sort of live walking distance or cycling distance, and but if you're in one of these hour-long commutes every day, then at the moment I cycle to work. It's about nice. fifteen minutes. I don't have to worry about rush hour. I can go in when I want and leave what I want. I don't have to worry about those kind of things. Um, Did you have to deal with that? A lot. Did you have to deal with that when you were in the UK? Yeah, a lot so, of commuting. So as I was an academic at the University of Manchester in the UK, um, and it was probably about an hour each way. Okay, and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to move somewhere else, and also why I chose to live where I do. Yeah. So I made a decision that I wanted to be able to walk into the CBD. So I live in Claudelands. Oh, nice. Uh, I wanted to walk in the CBD and I wanted to cycle to work. And that was what was important to me. And and that's made a really big you know, improvement to your quality of life than an hour in traffic each way. Yeah, I mean, you're just... You 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 you're just a bit weary. You get a bit tired, and I can and, totally relate. And from so we, in Auckland. yeah. So it's the it's the Auckland thing is where you're we're starting to get the push effect of away from Auckland economically from from a quality of life perspective, and the fact that you don't see your future there as much. Um, and the people coming to Hamilton are really good uh, economic from an economic perspective. They mm. invest, they buy houses, that they, they work, they go to schools. They 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 really. You know, they bring a lot more value than it costs them to service them. So they're brilliant. It's a, they're, we're growing, and we're growing in the, the most best possible way economically. Compare it to um, Tauranga. You know, one in two people who moved to Tauranga are over 65. Now, that is, and it's partly the Auckland effect again. Yeah. They're deciding to maybe sell up, realize the capital value in, in their home, get a house in Tauranga, you've got spare money, you go, you know, you, you you live your life and have a great, you know, 10, 20 years. Um, 
spending the kids' inheritance, and and you're um, you've also got great sunshine hours. I mean, it, it, it can be a very good quality of life there too. Um, but they're a very different demographic profile, which is you know they don't tend to set up as many businesses. They they don't you know the the kids don't. They don't spend as much. If you've got a young family, you spend a bit more. And they might have a slightly more drain on services, which will increase over when they get to 85 or 75. So your health budget. And, and there's all these things like that which, which come up. So Hamilton is benefiting massively from Auckland's poor planning, is a very <laughs> simple way to put it. Oh, and, and not just now. I'm talking about 50 years of poor decisions. So that's one yeah. of the other things that I, I, I think is worth um, pointing out is that Everything that you don't like now or that annoys you isn't working is a result of someone's decision in the past, sometimes quite long ago. So the reason why the CBD in Hamilton isn't performing as well, but it is starting to pick up, is part of you know decisions about where we site you know, retail and where we site where people live and those kind of aspects. So anything you don't like, someone made a decision on it. Okay. And that's what Probably I... Probably before we existed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I... I'm interested in is how do we make decisions for 2050 in order to, these things aren't quick fixes. They're not, you know, they're the simple policies or guidance. These are long-term structural changes of an urban form. I see a lot of people complaining that the government don't really think ahead. No, they don't. They're, they're, they're always playing catch up, it, it seems. It's partly the, it's partly the RMA, which is a, a, quite a, a poor instrument for any strategic planning it doesn't really do that it doesn't have a regional perspective it's what we call effects based so if you if your house doesn't annoy your neighbors if your come if your industry doesn't pollute the water you know we, we try and just manage the effects of development and that's an unusual model internationally you won't find that in a lot of places a lot mm -hmm. a lot of it is about planning for um growth over large spatial areas and um so I think we're getting towards that new zone. There's a real debate about infrastructure, which is leading us into all that, because you know infrastructure has a long investment span, a long and a long time span, and it covers multiple boundaries and regions. And yeah. so you need a mechanism to to pay for that and to decide who gets the benefit. And we don't really do that so much. It's left to the local authorities to provide infrastructure to cater for growth, when a lot of people beyond the boundaries benefit. And it's um, it's a really unusual model where the central government loads the debt on local government. This is one of the reasons why Hamilton's debt's gone up, Taronga's debt's gone up, is because the government have pushed the debt to us when in other countries, central government wears this debt and central government pays this investment. And that's one of the arguments I've been making is that I think central government have need to step up to their plate and give more money to local authorities to cope with the growth that they haven't. They just they collect their GST receipts and risk free, and they get the benefits from the you know our tax, mm. local taxes going up, and the you know the the global um, debt of New Zealand is tiny on an international scale. Mm. So you're in the US and the UK, it's 120, 100. It might commonly be around 70, 80, 90 percent in Europe. I think we're about 17, 18, 19 percent, <laughs> just, which is good. Yeah. And, and it's a good thing, but sometimes you've got to invest. In the same way that you own a house um, and you, your roof needs fixing, we've got a housing crisis. We've got an inf infrastructure crisis. We should be investing in these. And the question I'm interested in is who does it? And I think central government should do it rather than us, the local taxpayers. So do you think a way of alleviating the housing crisis is through – is public transport one one means, do you think? Yeah, so the housing crisis is a really fascinating topic because we haven't discussed it in any kind of sophisticated way in New Zealand generally. No. Anyone who says they can fix the housing crisis, you should just ask them, you know, they, they should go down in your estimation immediately <laughs> because there's no easy fix. It's no, the first thing. It's very, very complex as well. So, yeah, you've got a... And part of it is, is that what is a home has changed over the last 20 years in particular to become, you know... I mean, we're sat now in, in, in our home and, and, and it's a value to us as, you know, a place for us to live. And, but for a, it's not just a shelter physically. Um, now it's become a shelter for financial assets. And it's a way that... So New Zealand has some of the most unaffordable housing in the entire world. Yeah. I mean, top 10 cities. We're up there with Hong Kong. I mean, 
it's like, Taronga is up there with, you know, Hong Kong and Vancouver. And this is, if that is not evidence of policy failure, I don't know what is. But it's not the policies for which have failed. It's actually not just planning. It's it's mostly around, um, I mean, there is parts of undersupply, but that's not planning's fault either. Planning has never built a house. You know, actually yeah. the houses are built by owners of private capital or the people who buy the land and do it themselves. So we don't have a state building sector, which is something that Labour are trying to change. But really it's, you know, one of the, the problems is that how, after the financial crisis and, um, and the dot-com bubbles in 97, and then you had the other financial crisis in 2008, um, money fled a bit from stocks and shares towards other forms of investment. And so you had, um, and, and, and property became an asset class in of itself rather than a place to live. And so you see people buying properties and renting them out because the return was higher than you would get in the stock market in very simple terms. And it makes sense. If you can earn more money from than a house and stocks and you own capital and you want that capital to multiply, you, you know, that's what you do. So there's a lot of people who are multiple houses not just in new zealand but all around this is a global phenomena yeah um and so there's various ways you mediate that and, and partly it is around sort of offshore money and investment and, and partly it is around um capital gains tax which you know it, we had a discussion around it last year and i was really hopeful that we would actually get something because i i think it's you need to make it less attractive as an asset class in order to drive some of the flow of money into it, which is driving the escalation in price. Um, and it's not just about housing, it's the land value. So the land value has also gone up. It used to be about a third of the, basically the way a house works, it used to be roughly a third would be the land, roughly a third the building the house, and roughly a third would be profit to all the people who made it happen, Yeah, yeah. which is fair enough. And, um, but the land went up to about 50%. And it was because um, you know, there's a, the land was held by a, a lot of you know, fewer people. So a lot of the land outside Hamilton is held by big sort of landowners who were just waiting for the boundary to, and the zone change to go yeah. from, on you know, a stroke of the pen, this is a long-term bet, which might have been 10, 20 years in the main. They buy it as agriculture. And a stroke of a pen, you're talking, you know, uh, significant millions mm. and that's completely unearned wealth and in a way that's a punt on a land that's going to change you've not made anything you know you've not you didn't know? even do anything yeah. you just sit on it and and that's so that's not allowed in lots of countries around the world it, it, oh, okay. so that's another thing which you which is unique to is this idea of speculation on land is that land you can speculate on it and you can earn money over time and you need to have enough money to wear that risk for 20 years. So only it benefits the wealthy and not people like us. <laughs> Unless I'm <laughs> guessing you're not incredibly wealthy. You could I be. am not incredibly uh, wealthy. It could be Sorry. one of New Zealand's hidden I'm honored that you would even consider that I might be wealthy, <laughs> but I am not. <laughs> so part of the housing crisis, um, it's partly around the supply issue. And the supply issue is the way it works is that planners zone land developers build on that or they sell plots of land and you build your own and, and there you go but there's no incentive on developers to build enough land that actually stop, makes a profit go down you know mm. we've got a we've got the people we, who are charged with addressing the housing crisis and building more homes have no incentives to build more homes you know, if you if you build 100 homes your profit is x if you all of a sudden flood the market with a thousand homes your profits much lower than that and the price you've paid for the land was probably too much and so this is about structural readjustment of how a market allocates value to land and you can't do it too quick either because otherwise no, so too the, much money is I think lost, the best so. we can do is stabilize because there's a lot of people with assets that um you know these are these are people's biggest financial asset they might ever own in their life is 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 their home yeah. and you don't want negative equity so this is around you know now, probably the best thing from a social justice would be you would change the capital gains tax. So this would be less of an asset than it has in the panels. You'd you'd actually the state wouldn't get involved more directly in building the homes because it, the private market it just it can't do the things we want it to do. 
um, because it doesn't want to keep the price low and it wants the price to go up. So it has to become an actor in this. Um, and then you've got to do other things around uh, the type of homes that we develop. So we, we, we build the same kind of house in New Zealand. You drive around Hamilton, you know, 80% of it is pretty much the same kind of well, house. So, there's certain new suburbs that just every house looks the same. Yeah, so we've seen these things around, um, you know, parts of the CBD where we've seen this actually quite nice developments, three, four-story urban form, which is, um, you know, so the types of home we develop are, are starting to become part of it too. So it's partly about it as a financial asset. It's partly around, you know, who does it. But there's also things around economic restructuring. So, I mean, one of the one of the points I always make is that there's enough homes in New Zealand, but they're just not in the right place. And, and the fact that um, there's some great homes that have been for sale for ages. And it's partly because you don't have that link to economic activity, which is one of the things we started off talking about. So if you have an economic... A regional economics restructure and you push parts of these sort of high demand areas, push some of their functions out to the regions, you'd stimulate where there's a supply of houses that no one really wants and a supply of land, then you'd take a bit of the heat out of the market that way. So you can use national and regional economic policy to change the nature of where these hotspots are as well. And we don't do that at all in New Zealand. And that's one of the big things which um, I think should be addressed. We don't have any kind of regional economic policy. No, but I do find with the upper North Island, at least, you've got a lot of towns and cities within close proximity, which you could actually take advantage of. Yeah, this is, I mean, but then you need, I mean, partly is, I mean, proximity is a good word because um, one of the things which is will probably drive the train and make the train between Hamilton and, and Auckland a success is that, Essentially, what you're doing is making Auckland an hour, you know, being able to work in central Auckland an hour away from Frankton or whatever. And so it might, I mean, the suburb of Auckland is the wrong kind of terminology, but really, um, so you're, increase, city? you're increasing the land supply of um, for people who might want to work in Auckland. Mm. And so it's a really cheap investment from that way. You know, the average house is one point something million. You know, so 200 million, 200 houses. You know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. when you think about it, these are, and this is the purpose of a state. This is why we pay our taxes because they can do things that we can't as individuals. So I think by reducing the proximity between Auckland and other areas, whether it's Hamilton or, or, or other areas outside, you're increasing the supply of land for the Auckland workforce um, in a way which is much lower than it would be if you just built on the periphery or developed inside because the land value is so high. Mm. So you could actually, you know, the cost of that, if you, there's various economic sort of tools they use overseas to capture that added additional value, which we don't use in New Zealand either. So, um, for example, you put a road down anywhere, you depress the value of the surrounding land anywhere, really. You put a train next to it, you increase the value of the land. So it's... Oh, really? Yeah, generally speaking, or light rail. And so... And particularly around the station. So say you had, I mean, just say with a thought experiment, you, you have the, the train from Auckland to Hamilton comes down, you have f maybe four or five stops away on the way. And then areas around that, their land value would just go you know, north. It would mm. just increase. So if I was a speculative investment investor, I'd be looking geographically where those are and I would be buying the biggest tracts of land I can within... 15 minutes walk from those stations and I would wait 10 years and I would cash in and retire very wealthy. <laughs> um, so that's, but there's probably people already doing that. Um, yeah. And, and that value, the increase of an investment, why should they have it? Is my, is, is one of the arguments that planners have around the world. Why should we not buy it? Why should the government not buy it? And then they sell it to developers and they capture the uplift in value, which they use to pay for the train. Mm. Could, you might not get to cost neutral, but it'll be a lot cheaper on the public purse. And it's basically these decisions we make over how people move around the country have major uh, influences on the value of that land. But we don't play a game in that. And I think we should. And if we capture that value uplift, we can pay for the infrastructure and services that we like. There's also the productivity aspect as well, right? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, 
There, there's a whole lot of literature and, and research around kind of economic clustering and, and and agglomeration theory and and various other things that I teach. But basically, there's a lot to be said for putting a lot of things close together, um, particularly if they're similar industries. Um, so a concentration of um, media industries are around in similar places, or or those kind of or, or any kind of um, manufacturing that is a similar thing you put them close together you get benefits but when you get too much you get this benefits as well which is the congestion um the lack of amenity you know particularly green spaces and stuff like that because the land gets turned from recreation or rezone from recreation to housing and so there's trade-offs there's balance and trade-offs as a uh, and what you should be do, trying to do is to create these new clusters. So if Hamilton was to be a, one of the, an agglomeration in the future of various kind of economies, what should we be? So this is a debate that has been had over the last few years about what 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 could we be good at? So things around um, distribution. Because yeah, like a logistics hub. Logistics, inland port, all that kind of thing. You can see it. You know, you can look at a map. It's a spoke of a wheel. We're on the train network. We can and think, yeah, we, we could make a play for that, all that kind of stuff. Things around um, you know, the uh, in fast internet or, or those kind of high tech industries, you could probably do that too. But then there's also um, just generally things around quality of life i mean this is it's actually quite a dated conversation i mean and we we have it in hamilton but i'm i'm not a major fan of it because i think it's what we did 20 years ago we're trying to attract industry because an assumption but by getting industry here you're gonna attract a job and that'll be a worker and they'll spend money mm. but everyone does it and it evens itself out and so this is it's no one wins and on, well, basically the big people win and um, so we can't play that game so we have to be smart so what we should be doing is attracting people rather than uh, industry. So how do you do that? So you create the kind of place that people want to move to. And then so you make investments in the public realm. You provide a regional theatre. You provide lots of excellent green space. You have a high quality walking environment. You have a good, safe, separated cycle network. And you start to you support independent businesses rather than sort of the big retail stuff. Um, you support for young people, you know, young startups, um, sort of hubs for new businesses and incubators and, and this kind of things. Um, so there's, there's lot, loads of research out there about how you do this and, and why you do it. And, and the, it's the kind of places that attracts the 20 or 30 year olds, the kind of place that you know, the, the, the policies around arts in particular are really important in this kind of area. So if you have a high quality arts, there's things to do that attracts people with money able to spend on doing those things. So you create um, basically a place where people want to move to because there's this gravitational pull of attractions and, and things to do. So it basically means you change your public policy from trying to invest in manufacturing logistics hub to actually investing in your public realm, investing in cycle network, invest in, in quality green space and the arts and you just make it a great place to live and then all of a sudden everyone you know people want to move here and it just gains momentum and you get the money back so that's um you know the attracting people rather than industries is something i've been advocating since i've moved here because there's a lot of bare bounds which are really good here I mean, we've got a river you get access to you know raglan's not too far away there's a whole it's load not- of really this a quality of life uh, environment here. Um, and with a bit of, just a little bit of more investment on the arts and the public realm and the kind of quality aspects, rather than having the kind of city that just empties bins and builds pipes, yeah. you could really get a payback because there's mm-hmm. such a push away from Auckland of people who were looking for somewhere better. Because mm. it seems sometimes that there's this kind of fight or argument between Auckland and the rest of New Zealand. You know, a lot of the rest of New Zealand get frustrated because they feel all the investment is just put into Auckland. Yeah, they're just better at making an argument. I don't I don't think we've... I mean, Hamilton's about 10% of Auckland from an economic perspective. But if you start thinking about the Waikato, it's bigger, you know? And oh, I, I mean, it's massive. not bigger. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's closer. Yeah. 
And so we've never had a regional voice. I mean, and this is one of the, the other things I've been arguing for is that we should work collaboratively together as, you know, outside of the areas outside Auckland in a regional perspective. So Wiper, Waikato District Council, Hamilton. Do and, you think they should Jonga. amalgamate? I don't know, but I don't know whether you need, amalgamations are political tool in order to just try and concentrate decision making and make it smoother. But you can get a lot of the benefits of amalgamation by working more collaboratively without having that because the downside is you lose the local voice. Um, I'm not sure about amalgamation, um, I think, but but I am sure that we need to work together more more closely. And and if you do that, you could go. I mean, this is what Auckland have been really successful at. And it's not that they're the most successful at us, it's that we don't even play the game. So they go to central government and they say, we need $10 million for X. We need, we're need we going to build this um, this underground rail pipe and we're going to we're going to do this and and now the government will look at the proposal and they'll go yeah maybe we, we'll we'll help you out a little bit on that but we don't want to give them too much because we don't want to know the regions but we'll we'll give you a bit of money you know and and that's so you share the, the the financial risk but we're not necessarily been going to government in any way comparable you might say we need a bit of a bridge for peacocks can you give us a loan mm-hmm. um but i'm talking about the you know the upper middle north island going to government and saying this is the infrastructure we need between now and 2050 we want this we want this this is how much it costs and this is how we're going to help you pay for it by changing where people live in order to fund it we're going to have this value capture tax to get the money and all we need from you is x we don't play that game and we and it's partly because there's not enough um it's just not the way it's worked historically. This is a new thing. It's starting to happen a little bit. So the train's created a few of these conversations about, okay, we need we need to basically have an agreement about how it's going to work in this corridor. But there's no formal administrative boundaries with power that allows you to do that. So you've had to create like an informal structure of people, representatives. And there's like six parties, I think, involved yeah. just getting the train off the ground. And it's part of it. Is, and so... We don't have really the governance structure, would be the academic turn, to, to, to leave in more money from government. And I think mm. if we shifted things around, we could. Mm. That's interesting. So if you had a magic wand, what would be the first thing you'd do? For, for, for what? For New Zealand? Yeah, or for, New Zealand, for New Zealand. Oh, uh, we can do both. New Zealand and all the Waikato. I think I'd quite like... Um, I'd like, from a government perspective... I'd like them to um, invest in a national infrastructure plan, which would allow a bit of, um, basically we don't have a, Ireland has a plan, a national plan of the entire country about how it's going to develop, similar kind of size. We don't. Um, And it's partly because of the role historically governments have played in New Zealand where they don't like, they don't necessarily tell everyone how to do the business. They provide the broad structures and rules. But I think, we're starting to see the problems of that are becoming manifest now in, in our congestion, our poor, you know, the fact that we only have roads, really. We don't really have too many options of how to travel. Yeah. And so I'd quite like to see a national, um, a long-term spatial plan of the North Island and the South Island, the two separate things. So you can make regional economic decisions about what goes where and what you need and invest and send signals to markets around what you're going to do. Um and that's quite a, a technical thing, but I, I'd also quite like a capital gains tax or, or some kind of really progressive housing policy. Um, from a regional perspective, I'd like to see a bit, and I'd like to see, the problem is we don't have an awful lot of money in Hamilton. You know, we've had the rates increased. Um, there's a, you know, there's a lot of things that we need to pay for the roads and the infrastructure and the pipes. But I'd like to see a, I think, what might give you the biggest payoff is a safe separated cycle network within five years and just and just say we're going to wear it and it'll pay it all back because all the research all around the world says it's probably the biggest invest return on investment you can get is cycling. Um, not only, I mean, we've got quite wide roads in New Zealand, so we can retrofit it quite easily. Um, Hamilton's flat is perfect for it. We've got the problem of just a couple of bridges over the river and a lot of people work on one side and live on the other. It's mm. like a classic example of 
of short term decision making. <laughs> um, and so we need, um, we're going to start seeing more congestion. Um, and all the research also says is that you've put, you've put this in, it actually creates a big local economic spend because people, they don't drive out of the region. They, they cycle and they pick up bits and they do this. And 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 it's, it also saves you money in your health. But so um, it actually generates wealth for a local economy rather than a cost, which is any other form of transport investment is a cost. So it's, um, but it's just a bit, it just seems a bit bold for Hamilton, you know, and, and the fact that we've got a, a shift in council, it could happen, but it's just not the way we do it. So one of the things I quite like see is a vision. And I made this sort of case last year a few times, is that what do we want this city to be? How do you, how, what, you know, is it going to be the best place to live in New Zealand? And is that, if that's what you're going to do, then you invest in the things that make it the best place to make them. And you, change, you align your budget to deliver that rather than just say it. Mm. So at the moment, we've had our budget has just been the same roughly as it's been for the last decades. And there's a little bit of tweak here and there. But we really, I think we need to decide what we want, get the rules that deliver that, get the budget that delivers that and do it. And, and that's quite a different way of doing things. So I'd quite like to see more investment in the arts, the public realm, um, and, live, and it, things that make Hamilton a good place to live because I think you'll get a, a major return. Mm. If, if they came to you and asked you to write a plan, would you be open to doing it? I th- oh, to be fair, I've spoke to... You know, Have you spoken to Paula? Yeah, I've spoken to Paula around that then and a and, and number of occasions, not necessarily this exact conversation, but, yeah, 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 but yeah. and 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 she's she's probably sympathetic to this point of view. Oh, I've had her on, yeah. Um, and Absolutely. and I think some of the other councillors are too. But I mean, one of the things I, I talk about in decision making is that this is a risky decision. Yeah. You know that there's um, we still talk about the V8s in Hamilton, which I didn't even know what it was when I moved here. I looked it up <laughs> and I found out and. And we still see it cited sometimes in the, the local political chamber, in the press. Remember the V8s. You know, it's, it's this warning sign to get back in your box and stop thinking about these things and, and just, you know, just concentrate on emptying the bins and, and, and not taking any risks. So it is a, it is a, it's, a, it's a political risk in doing it. And the political safety is always on business as usual because yeah. that's, you know, an, an honor. And so I think we need to recognize that while there might be political sympathies in this kind of in this kind of arena, is that we need to make it safer for the politicians to make the decisions, and that's partly us as voters, and it's partly us as providing evidence of the the impacts and the benefits that you'll get, and just making that. So if we come to the point where it did go through council, there's evidence, there's research, there's a plan, there's the public are on board, and and then that's how democracy functions. So, a lot of people don't vote, though. That's the other problem. Yeah, and, and it is a problem in New Zealand, and I'm not quite sure how you arrest it. But Do you I tell your students to vote? I do, and they don't. <laughs> 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 but and that's why you've got an affordable houses, you know? Um, so, yeah, so I, you try and get them involved, but I think the other side of the coin is you've got to give them something to vote for, and I don't think we've done this very well. So we heard Louise Hutt ran for mayor last time. That was a real breath of fresh air. Hmm. I mean, she didn't get in, but she actually moved the dial and she changed things to actually become... So climate change wasn't something that people, others were scared to talk about. So she opened that up and others were asked on their position. Hmm. And these sort of more environmental and green issues came around with with Sarah Thompson as well. And so, um, you know, there, there are all these sort of there's a lot of sympathy for these kind of aspects, but we've got to, you know, you, you need a visionary mayor who's going to drive it because this is, you've got to stick your neck out a bit to do this kind of thing. And um, you've got to carry people with you and say, this is this is my vision. Um, this is why. Are you going to back me? Because mm. there's a lot of local politics is around, you know, it's the, you know, it's the identity politics of either attacking another candidate or I'm not interested in any of that. A long-term plan, which you might not even be around to see it realized. You'll yeah. probably be voted out by then. But the things that we started off this conversation, the things you enjoy, you know, the, the Hamilton Gardens, they fought over that. And that took a vision. What's our vision now? What, what should we be doing? So I'm trying to bring 
more vision back. I don't necessarily mind what it is, but I, I like the, the, the ambition and the thinking, and it just opens up this world of possibilities that's much beyond the sort of day-to-day -day stuff around the sort of bends or, or um, you know, this stuff that we talk about a lot in the paper about people complaining about stuff because it's normally a reaction against some kind of you know, short-term policy. But really, we don't have enough long-term strategic conversations, I don't think. Would you ever run for no. mayor? No. Not interested in getting into politics at all. <laughs> You'd probably be very good. Well, I, I, I appreciate... But very stressful. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I'm happy to support any of the local councillors and mayor. I recognize it's a, a difficult job. And I also understand that no one goes into politics to do the wrong thing, you know? Oh, no. <laughs> they, they, all, they all believe that they're, they're doing the right thing and they're running and they've got good in their hearts. I don't think... I think there's a lot of real goodwill there that I have for the local politicians is that they're all really in it for the right reasons, but they it's very hard to think about these long term when you've got your day to day stuff going on of your reports for committees and your paperwork and and finding the space to do these kind of visionary aspects is you know, it it is difficult. And maybe that's where you do need a university involved where you can't actually just put a bit of money aside and do this. Well, one of the things Louise Hutt said when she was on here and she was running um for council, she said she wanted a, a you know, like a group of people to help with these decisions. Yeah. Um, just ref to refer to them, right? Because a councillor can't know everything. A mayor doesn't know everything. They have to work in conjunction with a lot of people anyway, and they're not experts in the subject. So yeah. they form like a bit of a committee of some sort, I suppose. That, there has been these in the past. I mean, um, I think part of the problem is, is that, um, and I have been on a number of these committees, both for this uh, local government and other ones overseas and 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 the problem is is that it's got to be a good use of time in the way that you see it having an influence right otherwise it's a bit of a you know it just makes your individual decisions look more evidenced <laughs> because <laughs> oh i've got this panel and um we've you know that's how we do things when really you know if you're not listening to them so there's got to be a, a thread which path of uh, where these evidence actually you see it having an influence so i think there needs to be a little bit of uh, power given to them mm. rather than just a, a panel or a committee and then you start to say uh then there's really, you know, there's really good discussions about well, what might that look like and how you might do it because they're not ele they're not elected, so the power has to ultimately last rest with people, but the the, the councillors. But I think it needs to be a closer relationship where you you start to see the evidence being relied on and having an impact and, and changing things because you know there are areas in the University of Waikato where we are genuinely world leading, um, genuinely world class, such as. Um, there's a whole lot of things on water quality, um, the uh, soil science, and, and basically in every faculty, there, is, there are people who um, are genuinely world class and are renowned as world class. We don't necessarily blow their trumpets enough in, in Waikato, but internationally, they are renowned. So Bruce Clarkson, for example, you know, oh, uh, who, who, uh, you know, he's an internationally renowned, you know, He's round the corner and he's fighting the council to do something where other you know, cities around the world are paying him for his advice, you know? And, and, and so there's, there needs to be pathways for this science to influence. And that will probably be a good thing to work on. I know, I know it was discussed at various times for the election about the restoration of panels or, or advisory boards or whatever you call them. And I think that would be a good first step. I know there's been discussion about one well, on climate change uh, because it is so um, science and evidence led. You need to know about projections and impacts on what you know and what you don't know. And then you need some information over what's been done in other cities around the world and what's viable and what might the cost of these things be. And then it feeds through. But you can't expect a local councillor who to be, you know, an expert in multiple areas. It's just not viable. So it's not possible. Yeah, and and so this is where the the ways that they operate and the ways they take um, sort of guidance off people become really important. And it's quite nice that it's transparent as well in that way. Mm. So they they get advice and guidance every day. You know, probably someone will tap them on the shoulder on the way to the car. But 
you know, this is this is more evidenced and, and research guidance from people who are knowledge experts on stuff. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's going to happen because scientists maybe not know the best anyway. You know, they're they're not trained in politics either. And and so this no. is this is a relationship which we could make stronger. Do you worry though with the area area or era, I suppose, of fake news? Like how do you combat that stuff? Because I'm sure you would see stuff online yeah. and, and be concerned. I had a bit of a discussion with a guy who um who believes that I mean, whether it's true or not, I have no idea, but he said that the UN are primarily funding scientists who believe in climate change as opposed to scientists who do not, and therefore the, it's become this big conspiracy that's not actually real now the un don't really fund climate i mean it is and i take it it's not just this it's um but i'm using this as an lot, example yeah, obviously yeah. of some of the stuff that can, yeah we can live in put out there we live in post truth post facts um you know it, it's just part of our everyday uh, world now you know we have facebook which is the largest you know, probably the largest disinformation platform in history. Yes. Yep. And which is allowed to run unregulated, <laughs> which is, I think in 10 years time, we'll look back on that thing. No wonder we had the kind of, um, you know, politics we had or the decisions we had or why we didn't act on climate change because, you know, they're taking all the global media spend that used to go to people like the Waikato Times. All the advertising is now going to them. Yeah. And so we're at the same time we've seen the the depression of local economies and local investigative reporters and national reporters because they don't have the funds to invest in this because Facebook has you know have, have got all the advertising money, and so we're allowing this to happen unregulated and it's really difficult to know what is what is rigorous uh, and there's a lot of stuff where there, there aren't facts on this you know how does information become a fact it's a you know, it, it's about the gradual sort of weight of evidence that gathers over time. And if something's quite new, you know, it's quite difficult to be certain about it. And I mean, I'll, I have to check things about six, seven different times just to yeah. make sure that they're real. And even then, I'm still doubting myself. I'm like, is this real? Is it not? I don't yeah, know. There's an inti- and there's, I think it's beyond – there's a new research area which is quite interesting called agnotology, which is about the deliberate production of ignorance. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you – You've got this uh, um, machinery of uh, industries which benefit from how thing, the way things are at the moment. You know, industries, particularly around, you know, you've seen tobacco in the past and, and you've seen other things around raising questioning the veracity of science and raising doubt that we don't know enough, we shouldn't really act yet. There's entire um, PR companies which are designed to do this around the world. Um, and this is all really well documented. And, and it's filled this new research out called agnotology, agnotology, which is fascinating, which is about ignorance as being something which is deliberately produced. So ignorance isn't the absence of knowledge. It's something which is manufactured by actually creating disinformation and, and providing alternative facts and alternative truths from these institutes which are funded by dark money, which isn't transparent. And, and you, But you know that they're... You know, they wouldn't operate in a commercial climate. They're, they're, they're providing the service and the needs of some partner which is opaque. Um, and a lot of it isn't, a, you know, it just isn't transparent. And it's the world we're living in at the moment. It basically means that to navigate these waters as a, a citizen is pretty tricky. You know, as an academic, it's quite tricky too. I mm. mean, there's an awful lot of research out there and it's difficult to keep on top of it. Um, but it, it, it goes back to that, well, Maybe this is about closing the links between, you know, scientists and universities and decision makers in order to try and navigate this sort of post-truth era where there is a lot of alternative facts. Because that's one of the things I'm teaching on Monday is what is rigorous, what is reliable, how do we know? I mean, there's certain ways you can work it out. But um, this is a skill which is probably going to rise in importance. Mm. Do you get ever, Do you ever get students that question you? Question your information. Oh yeah, that's the uh, and, that's and the I don't, beauty of I it. I don't mind it at all. You know, this yeah, is yeah. the 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 beauty of working in a university is that you can have these free and frank discussions. And um, 
I mean, there's a lot of things that I don't know either. And yeah, and, yeah. and it's it, you need to sometimes explore these together and work out what you do know and what you don't and, and what is a fact and what is from ideology about how you'd like the world to be. Yeah. And and I mean, you know, if you type in why climate change is made up by the UN into Google, you would get a hit straight away and you go, aha, I am right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's just, you know, so there's a real, I use the phrase, um, with data rich information poor we've never had as much data as we've had now you know in our entire lives and it's going up year on year massively the amount of data that decision makers have got from smartphones or geolocations or or, or live traffic cams or whatever there's data everywhere and it's all over the internet it's produced at all times and but what does it mean mm. and that's what i mean data rich information poor i think a, a real key skill of your future employee um, will be, be able to turn data into information to tell you what it means and how reliable it is and what we can infer from it and what's what's just noise and what's actually a signal. Mm. Well, I might wrap up there. <laughs> okay. That was amazing. Thanks for coming through. It uh, took you a while to get here. I know. But, uh, it was, but uh, I know you're busy, so it's okay. Yeah, well, there's all these things being on in the background, which we actually had a nice segue into all natural hazards and risk and housing and economic generation, which are my research yeah, topics. Yeah. So. We could probably talk about this for hours, to be yeah. perfectly fair. Well, uh, thanks for the invite. And That's all right. Yeah. And so, um, obviously, you work at the University of Waikato. You obviously do the odd lecture here and there. Outside of uni time? Yeah, yeah. yeah so. uh, I quite like, um, I think it's important that academics um, speak directly to the public. Yeah. I think it's part of our, you know, the reasons why we're we're funded and we should do. So I feel that as a bit of a responsibility as part of my job is to, is to try and do public events or public lectures or, you know, the odd newspaper column or something um, because I just think, you know, it's a really good way to communicate directly with people and de-risk that decision making, which we we talked about earlier. Yeah. So if anyone wants to uh, go to any of his lectures um, outside of uni time, just just stay what stay connected to Facebook. Uh, What's the best way of them finding out? Uh, there's actually it's a really good question at the moment because there's there's one coming up which is massive. Um, it's a really big event for the university in the region, which is uh, March the twenty seventh. Okay. We've got Professor Michael Mann coming to speak oh, at Waikato. Yes, yes, I Probably saw that. the most high profile scientist in the world. Maybe the well, definitely the most high profile climate change scientist in the world. Yeah. He's you know, testified to the US Congress. He's very active and um he's given a public lecture at the University of Waikato on March the twenty seventh. If you just what Good. time? Uh, it's 6.30. 6.30 uh, p.m. It's free entry, but you've got to register because there's a limited amount of tickets. And he'll be giving a 30-minute lecture, and then it's going to be a, a, a one-hour Q&A with me and questions from the audience. Oh, cool. So that is going to be um, you know, the next exciting big event. Yeah, yeah. Which uh, everyone's invited to until the tickets sell out. So where, where can you register? Um, it's online on the university website. It's on Eventbrite. If you uh, find it on March the 27th, an evening with Michael Mann, it's called. Okay. All right. I'll post links on Spotify and YouTube. And it might already be sold just... out. I'm not sure, but it will sell out. So yeah, yeah. Uh, get involved. Cool. All right. Well, that's the show, everyone. Uh, make sure you share, like, and subscribe. And until next time, stay safe. See you later. All right. Thanks, everyone.